Well, I'm going to go ahead and start. I'll start slow and let people trickle in some. I'll do an introduction. Not that it matters. Uh, I'm Rick Redman. I'm Minga. Uh, I guess more people may know me as Crack Me If You Can. I run the uh, password cracking contest at DEF CON every year. And uh, I almost always speak about password cracking, but I figured I'd maybe try to do something different because I can talk about that nonstop. Uh, I work for CoreLogic, small company. Um, if you saw Mudge's presentation at DEF CON or Black Hat, he talks about a lot of projects that we work on. Um, spoke at DEF CON, Sky Talks, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I was raised in Louisville. I used to run BBS here, but now I'm in Austin, Texas. Um, I've got a few shirts left over from the DEF CON contest, and all you have to do is tell me the password, and that's the MD5 hash. Uh, I'll show it again at the end. Uh, you don't have to type the whole thing in, most likely. So anyways, um, I'm just going to go ahead and kick in. Uh, the purpose of what we're going to talk about is we're talking about penetration testing. I want, I, I want to tell stories. I love telling stories. I want to laugh at other people's mistakes. I want to feel superior to them. Uh, you know, it, but, it, but as we laugh and point and stuff like that, we're going to sort of share in how large companies are owned. I mean, how is it really done step by step from beginning to end? Uh, and then also you can kind of learn the, how, how they're managing and how they're securing it. And then the main thing as I wrap it up toward the end is what's the importance of O-Days in all of this? Or even exploits. I don't care if it's an O-Day, it could be a seven day, it could be a two year day. The importance of exploits and that's like a question mark. And to give you an idea, we're talking about like Fortune 50. Uh, the big example that's in here is Fortune 50. So. We're talking about 300,000 to 500,000 users in a single sign-on. So we're talking very, very big. Uh, so a note to everyone here in the audience, don't read my slides. There's way too much up there and it's kind of for me to look at and so that people online can look at it later and they can really get a feel if they're not here in the audience. There's really going to be nothing up there that you need to write down notes wise. I'd much rather you close your eyes or look at me because if you just read it, you're not really going to get a feel for what's important. Uh, I added that because I put way too much stuff in the slides. So the, the first thing is I want you to sort of understand what a CISO is or a CSO, Chief, Inf Chief Information Security Officer, right? Shirt, tie, window office, because they're either on the board or report to the board, BMW, CISSP, okay? That kind of gives you an idea of if you're, doing, if you're doing a pen test, that's who it's going to. They care about metrics and improvement, and they have to be able to track all that stuff, because it's not like uh, there's something easy that says whether or not they're doing a good job or not. Like, well, I didn't get owned this week, so I must be doing a good job. But they need other things, okay? And we have to prove to them and to other people that in general they're doing a good job and that their team's doing a good job. And that's a lot of what we're talking about today is I want to give them things that show that they're doing a bad job or a good job that no one else can give them. So how can we help them? Um, you know, they, they have a huge budget. They have all the tools. They've got the commercial nessus. You know, I, you know, they've got Metasploit Pro. They've got, you know, the $20,000 software that supposedly fixes everything. They've got it. They run it every week and they get the reports and then they go around and they try to figure out. You know, so what's the point in me showing up and running those same tools? Now, obviously, it's real easy for all of us to, to go and bash people who just go and do that. But I'm saying don't run them at all. Now, that's obviously not what we actually do. We, you know, you run and you let them find some stuff and maybe you use it. So, well, okay, well, if you're going to tell me not to run these big commercial tools that do all the scanning and all the zero-day hacking and stuff like that, well, oh, well, then what you're telling me is I should be elite and go get a zero-day and go and run it, you know. But what does that prove? What does that prove if I own a single system with a zero-day for them, okay? And that's, that's... That's the main thing for what we're here to talk about. So let's start really simple example-wise. Remember the RSA attack? It was like a spear phishing um, attack. Uh, a certain email came in. It supposedly it was like an Excel attachment, uh, theoretically, and they opened it, and boom, they got owned, and then that turned into turned into turned into. What was what was the problem? What is there to fix? Um, I mean, hey, well, our antivirus should have caught it. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Well, the main thing, the first thing that happened wrong was the stupid user clicked on it. You know, who, I, whoever's talk I just came from earlier is, don't click on it, don't click on it, don't click on it. That's the issue. You know, no, and they got mega owned. And what started the whole process was someone clicking on something they shouldn't have clicked on, okay? So what's the fix? How do you fix that? Oh, well, I put an antivirus on my exchange server and I'll monitor all. No. The fix there is training. 
you know, is, is telling people not to do it. So that's just like a real simple example of someone getting massively owned and the fix is like a management thing. You, you know, you go to RSA, say, yeah, 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 fix all that technical crap. Yeah, you got a million people telling you all that stuff, but why the hell did your person click on it to begin with? Okay, well, let's think about like anonymous and lulsec, okay? Theoretically, how do they do their attacks? Well, you know, a lot of them really seem like they're SQL injections, and a lot of them, okay, we'll stick with that one. A lot of them seem like they're really basic SQL injections. Ooh, cutting edge. You know, they've been around for 13 years. We know the problem and we know how to fix it. Well, what's the fix? The fix isn't you go and you go and buy the commercial version of Burp and you go and run it against your software. Well, it is some, you got some auditing and testing, but there's a reason that PCI requirement requires all PCI compliant developers to have training. It's because I go and do PCI training and I go and I say, here's what a SQL injection is. And everyone in the room goes, oh crap, that looks really bad. And I'm like, how is this even new knowledge? That is how you fix this. The fix is training and auditing. The fix isn't some tool, you know? It, it, so it, that's what these other companies, outdated software, okay, well, what's the issue there? It's not, oh, well, you're missing patch, uh, you know, MS 0867. Uh, that's, that's not the issue. The issue is why is that machine out there? You know, was it, is it, was patching forgot, everything like that, and default and lane credentials, the same thing. What led up to the situation? No tool is going to tell you, is going to answer uh, what led up to the situation where you had a machine out there with a default password, okay? These are the kind of things that CISOs care about. Okay, so here's a big example, and this is real. Fortune 50, okay. So this is actually what happened. This is actually my job. This is actually what I did. I show up on site. They let me in the building. I was, it was announced. Everyone knew I was coming. I plugged into the network. They put me in a, in a very nice conference room. And I plugged in, and I was not on their internal network. They don't know my MAC address. They don't know my computer. I'm not running a little piece of crap software that they enforce everyone to run. And I wasn't on their internal network. Which is cool, does your offices do that? I mean, are you, if, if someone broke into like a random factory in a third world country and plugged in on their network, they're not on your internal network. They're on the segmented network with everyone else that's not authenticated. So what we did was we set up like a fake SMB server with the whole challenge response, one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four hack. I'm not gonna go into that, but if you don't know what that is, just there's a Metasploit module and it's been around forever. Just go Google one, one, two, 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 three, three, four, four, five, 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 six, six. So we set that up and just waited for broadcast SMB traffic. Sure enough, a random computer says, oh, I'm looking for this machine. Uh, I'm looking for this file server. And we said, hey, I'm that file server. You know, and then we, we challenged response with, this, with the challenge that I hard coded and I, we started getting some password hashes and it's a certain format you can load it in the John the Ripper and Hashcat and OCL Hashcat and I'm, I'm sure the commercial ones too that are horrible. Um, so we do that, we get some passwords and we go to crack them and sure enough, bam, one of them cracks instantly and we look at it and we're like, well hell, that looks, you know, it's not trivial. It was kind of two words with some numbers in the middle and some mixed capitalizations and we said, well, why the hell did that crack so fast? Damn, I'm good, you know. So as it turns out, the guy who connected to us, he was a domain admin and he happened to have a laptop that was on this untrusted network and we had cracked his passwords the previous years. So we now cracked his credentials and we're like, well, let's just authenticate to the network, to the internal network, and then bam, we're now on the internal network using just from a basic SMB because they allowed broadcast traffic. You know, broad, if you're on the network, you can broadcast to other people just like everyone in this room. If you're on the network, you can broadcast to everyone else, theoretically. Uh, hopefully not. So anyways, we're now authenticated. We gain access to the corporate internet, intranet, I'm sorry. So, you know, you're on an internal network, it's, it's, we're talking um, uh, 60,000, 80,000 machines, I forget what the total ended up being, it's, it's spread over hundreds of countries. Port scans, blah, 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 gain access to a single Unix box where the password is equal to the login, this is all trivial stuff, you know. Um, but sure enough, we get on a machine and Nessus will find you that. Nessus will find, you know, except for it didn't know the usernames. We enumerated the usernames and it was like, you know, uh, Linux foo and the password was Linux foo. And, you know, the tools will find that. But once we got on it, it was like, it's time to pillage. I'm on one Unix box. It's time to pillage. 
okay? And uh, someone gave a talk earlier where they just talked for hours and hours and hours all about how to pillage data from all these other places. I mean, it's you know, pretty easier. In this case, we went into everyone's home directories, found SSH private keys. Okay, well, we all kind of have them, but they had no passphrase. So you take a single SSH private key from a single machine, take that, and log into 100 machines. So immediately, we're on 100 Unix boxes. And that all have their own individual vulnerabilities, such as a NetRC. Has, does anyone use NetRC files? Does anyone know what a NetRC file is? Yeah, it, it, it's so you can use FTP without having to type in your login and password. The 80s called, you know, they want their technology back. I mean, it's literally like, oh my gosh. And it was world readable, and it had uh, mainframe credentials and stuff like that. You know, not important stuff. So, more and more Unix boxes, more and more credentials, more and more SSH keys. It just kept doing it. Side note, they had locked down sudo so good. Because in the year past, we totally burned them on sudo because they didn't let us do sudo bash, but we could do sudo Perl. All right, so we'll sudo Perl system sh, bam, you got a root shell. They locked down sudo so good that you could not, they listed, you can only run these five commands. And their, I guess their sudo config went from 8,000 lines to 300 lines. So we gave them mad props because we never got around sudo. Because you could sudo ls, and that's like the first command I do, and I'm like, yeah! And then everything else failed. And I was like trying to sudo awk and sudo expect, and I mean, just everything. So anyways, eventually we're poking around, we're, we're getting the lay of the land, scans going. We find eight systems where the root password is the name of the company all leet. You know, E is a three and a blah, blah, blah you know, all that stuff. Well, you know, that's because we kind of were like, you know, I bet you we'll try this and let's just go try once on every machine because I'm not going to lock out root by trying once. Sure enough, I found eight machines on the corporate network that that was the root password. Two of them were Unix admins workstations that were set up by them like VMware images and they weren't, you know, the, the company policy was I'm a fucking Linux admin, I'll do whatever the heck I want, let's do this. One of them was like the super duper Unix admin and got into his home directory, this is, and just did some basic pillaging, SSH key with the passphrase, oh, someone finally learned, and then they put a text file right next to it with the passphrase. In a world, you know, so, what, so the question is, well, what's the issue? Well, that's obviously you know, an administrator doing something that is massively affecting. That key got us on 99% of the Unix machines in the entire network, the SAP infrastructure, every Oracle server and every environment and everything as root. That person, that one person's key was in the root authorized keys file. So now, you know, we're on 600 Unix boxes as root. Did not take very long, okay? Now, some of the stuff we found with, you know, that you could easily find with little tools, but then other things like getting on there, going, looking for SSH keys, pulling them off, and then thinking, well, if I was a user and I had an SSH key, then I would go and make it so I could log in everywhere. If I was a user, I wouldn't want to be constantly having to type my passphrase, so I'm not going to put a passphrase on it. And oh, by the way, policy says I don't need a passphrase. So, as we keep going, we're stealing, now that we're rude on all these other machines, there's like master Unix machines, and every kind of place has them. You know, we're talking like, you know, we're, there's like four accounts. So we keep stealing keys because no one uses passphrase except for the one guy, and the one guy who does has a text file, um, you know, right next to it. And the, and the passphrase was like the name of the company, and then space, and then like a leet word, you know. Um, which I wouldn't have been able to crack, but uh, still. So anyways. We're attacking, we're attacking, we're just jumping, using what we have, uh, abusing what the users are doing, uh, going on and on. And eventually we get to the one of the main sort of like jumping stations. And, and the problem they had was they had bazillion accounts everywhere. I mean, this is tons of Unix machines and they've got tons of users and they got sick of managing it. So, so here's what we're gonna do. If you, user A, who's not an admin, wants to get on a Unix box, you have to go to this jump station and then it's gonna forge you on by running sudo sh and it's gonna sudo you as root, because that's safe. And then it logs all your keystrokes on that server so that if there's ever an issue, you know, they can do things. And a lot of companies sort of have to do that. I don't know why they were doing it, but a lot of finance companies have to do that. Um, so, you know, by doing that, we can just jump as anyone to all these, they actually have a segmented network where the SAP is all segmented. And it's only allowed to be accessed from the jump machine, okay? So, we, you know, you sort of keep going like that. We got on the master LDAP server, single sign-on SSO, uh, and uh, one of the cool things was we, you could sniff the Ethernet, uh, you know, ETH0, uh, 
and get plain text credentials in because they did LDAP authentication for everything, but they had a load balancer to make it so it didn't impact the systems, and then they just put the systems right behind the load balancers and had them use plain text SSL. But it's all on a flat network. So you could just jump to those machines, sit there and sniff interface, and, and you'd be getting in 15 character passwords that you would never crack. So once on the LDAP machines, we got about 500,000 salted shaws out of there. Salted shaws are very slow to crack, but you know, we can still crack 15% of them like that. So anyways, at this point, we've owned everything on Unix. Not using exploits, not using you know, Uber tools and stuff like that. Well, it's time to go to Windows. So we had domain admin credentials from the beginning because of the, of the simple little mistake. Yeah, you, we migrated to Wins and ran Hashdump. Uh, it, it actually didn't work because their domain is so big it kept timing out. In a Metasploit, if you run Hashdump, it runs for 60 minutes. We're like, okay, we'll change it for two hours. Two hours didn't do it. We eventually told it to go for 6.5 hours till we had to leave on Friday and it's still timed out. So uh, we were still on there, we extracted the data and I was able to get some of the data out and I got 50,000 uh, NTLMs. Um, but eventually, there's 1.5 million NTLMs in that directory because they have password history installed for all their users. And they have Landman installed on their domain controller, which is like, I have been telling people to disable that for, I mean, I don't even know how long, it's five, six, seven, eight, nine years. So currently, of, what, of the 50,000, whatever I have, it's 99.4% cracked you know, because of Landman. Okay. Now, obviously, why the hell is Landman installed? I'm sure they'll come back and say, oh, we have you know, Windows 95. Well, there were some other funny things we ran along along the time that was like, hey, what the hell is this? Because we cracked zero root passwords. Even we had hashes on every single 600 machines, we cracked zero of them. And then I saw, we, you know, you're looking at people's history files, finding out what the admins are doing and stuff like that. And they keep running this retrieve command, and we're all searching in slash opt and slash user look for retrieve, and we can't find it anywhere. As it turns out, it's just an alias in the bash RC. You know, it's a giant waste of time. So literally, you run this command called retrieve, and it's part of Power Keeper or Power Broker. Uh, kind of for a funny, go Google Power Broker, and when the result comes up, like what it says, it's like, finally a way to secure your Unix machines. And that's like how they sell Power Broker. So literally, you go down there and you say retrieve, S is the host name, which obviously I blacked out or whited out. And then you say, I want the root password, and it comes and says, oh, there's the IP address, uh, there's the reason you specified why you want access, and then there's the root password, and I kind of blotted it out, obviously. So how are the root passwords stored? Where are they stored? How are they stored? They're stored in plain text on a database by this power keeper or power broker software, you know? Now, it does do some cool things where like when you request the root password, it gives you 480 minutes and then it's gonna go and change it so that I can't come back a year from now and have the same root password. So it's at least that. Uh, and actually, they're, all the root passwords were stored using Blowfish, which is something, I, I don't know, even, I, I can't give them too much credit because I don't know if they did that on purpose. So, so here's something else. We're actually, you know, you're a member of the domain, you can go and browse it, like the, the basic file share of the domain and they've got these, uh, you know, corporal applications, AD extract, and then sure enough, there's a text file in there where it, it's an FTP script where it goes to the master LDAP server, the IDX is the login, that CTR is the password, and then bam. What level of access do you think that the, the script that does backups does? Do you think it's guest level or do you think it's admin level? You know, it admin, you know, because it needs access to everything. It's sitting there in a text file. And uh, the part that's blacked out was actually a reference to a year that was like not recent. So we know that password's kind of been the same. Now, you can go and yeah, I'm sure the, there are scripts out there that can go and run and pillage and stuff like that. But this is like an example of well, why is this here? You know, back up for a second. Why the hell are you using FTP to get your backups? You know? So there's sort of a different issue here than what you normally expect. Now, this one's a little different where. Uh, OWA, Outlook Web Access, is awesome if you've gained anyone's credentials because they can be logged into Outlook and you can log into the web portal of Outlook and go and read all their email and everything and they have no idea and there's no way for them to know you're doing it and there's no way for them to kick you out. So it's really great once you get an admin's password to just go and if an email does come in, you can just like, like delete it or go, oh shit, they're onto us, change, you know, things like that. So, so we're poking around and I get into an Oracle person's data and I didn't spend tons of time doing this. For me, it's bam, 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 bam. This machine's not important, let's go. So in this case, there's an email and it's to 
uh, a first name and last name, and the first name is H E something, and the last name's W something. Well, look at their temper. Well, look at the date it was sent. It was sent September twenty second. Look at the password. O nine twenty one. September 21st, and then it's W1H1. Well, where do, what do you think the W is? It's the last name. The H is the first name. I went through 20 of these emails. Guess what the first four characters were on all the emails that were sent that day? So obviously the issue is, oh my gosh, I can get access to Oracle and I can go and enumerate your databases. That's not the issue. That's not what they need to fix. You know, how many, how do they know that this account has ever been used? Because it says, oh, you have to go change your passwords, but they don't know that that's been done, you know? So how many default passwords do you think I know on that Oracle database? I know everybody's. You know, I've got a list of everybody's names anonymously from the LDAP server already, and you can just go and, and go like that. Did I do that? No. Why? Why bother? I mean, it, it doesn't matter if I found one of them or found 10,000 of them. The thing is, I still found it. You're still doing it that way. I don't care what technology is going to prevent or whatever like that. The problem is, this is what your people are doing, and you need to tell your people not to do that. So anyway, so that was one day. That was five, that was a five day internal pen test, two people. And on top of that, uh, the whole being trapped in that whole other segment, we had to go and pretend, you know, enumerate the internal network from over there and we wasted a day and a half doing that. So, so here's another, here's just a completely different test, okay? Uh, it's kind of like a Fortune 100 uh, finance company. Internal network, plug in, you're good to go. Start port scanning AIX box with a blank root password, okay. A tool can find that. We all know what the problem is. And of course, you tell people about it, and it's like, oh, well, that's a dev machine. Uh, it, was, it was just installed, and it's, you know, it's not that big of a deal. This place still uses NIS. For those who don't know, imagine having a world-readable shadow file on every single Unix machine that works on every single Unix machine. So you can just get on any Unix box and say ypcat password and it dumps the shadow file that is valid on every single one of the Unix machines. We've been telling them to disable that forever, but we can't. Um, so anyways, you know, so we, we sucked out 2,800 accounts, cracked 760 pretty quick, eventually by the end of the week got 1,700 and now obviously we've, we've done many more than that or whatever. So, you know, now we've got all these lists of credentials, let's use them. We know they're valid, we're not going to lock anybody out. We literally, we know they're up to the second because that's how NIS works. So let's just go start brute forcing. Or not brute forcing, brute logging. I don't know what the hell you call it. So you, you just go crazy, okay? And that's the problem with NIS. So eventually we go and we found this one account where the login was the same as the password, but it was like a system level account. And it accesses hundreds of machines with a user that can run sudo. Okay. Now they had a sudo lockdown. I mean, they had go and made groups and said which commands you were allowed to do. But at the very bottom of the sudo config, they also said, oh, any like system or batch account, it can run anything it wants without the password. And I'm like, oh, I got the password. It didn't even want it. So obviously, you know, and, but you couldn't do sudo bash. You couldn't do sudo ksh or sudo csh because they had kind of locked it down. But you could do sudo Perl. You know, and, and, and the funny thing was after a while I got sick of doing pseudo Perl, like I'm going to see if I can do it with expect, you know, and just pseudo Python, you know, anything, you know. So now, not only are we on hundreds of machines, we're on hundreds of them as root. So same sort of thing as the other tag, tons of SSH keys with no passphrases, but the thing is, they use NFS for home directories. We're on all these machines as root. You can just go and say, mount that guy's home directory. Mount that guy's. Mount that guy's. And you can say, oh, well, I'm PID 100. Let me mount PID. Because that's, that's NFS's protection, you know, is, oh, well, your UID 0. You can't get to UID, you know, 4's thing. And you can just say, oh, I'm 4. And then it lets you into their home directory. Well, you know, well, in a, it, it, so here are these massive home directories that people have everywhere. So if, if you have a key, an authorized key file, it's going to get you on everything because of NFS. We can't get rid of NFS. We depend on it. I've been, we've been having this conversation for quite a while. So even down to the LDAP single sign-on server, which is the keys to the castle, it, it's, an, it, it's a NIST member, you know? How many people actually need to log on to a machine that's that important, like four or five? But no, it was a member of the NIST. Every single user could log into it. There was no separation of duty. You know, that's, yes, that's a technical fix that you need to do, but, I mean, why the hell is it being managed that way? 
well, it's a hell of a lot easier to manage a system like that. Well, why don't we make it so that only these users can log in? Well, then you have to go and make this massive thing where you say what users are allowed to log in to which machines and make it all secure. That's a pain in the ass. I'm not going to do that. So, uh, you know, from the, Windows of the, from the Windows side of things, it was so easy. They, tr they do training where they train people about good passwords. And they also have a password policy that requires them to change their password every three months. In most places, like here, here in Louisville, every three months, what happens? The seasons change. I live in Texas, and we got rid of the shitty season, so that doesn't happen where we are. <laughs> that's, not, that's someone else's joke. I can't take credit. Yeah. So, so anyway, so there, if you went and said, oh, what season is it? Well, theoretically, it's fall 2011, and that would be 30% of their passwords. Because they told people, like, oh, well, if you have to, to remember your password, use this. And it, it, it was rampant. It was rampant all the way through the admins. So eventually, you know, I said we were on the master Unix machines and stuff like that. You know, the Unix machine kind of needed to trade information with the Windows, so we'll give it an account. And by the way, we should just go ahead and make it domain admin. So sure enough, sitting on a text file and a shell script were domain admin credentials for the Windows machines. Just like that. And then, oh, by the way, the domain credentials, that's how you log into all the routers and switches. So here they are. They're so SS single sign-on. It's going to save us. It's going to save us. It's going to save us. And, it, you know, if they had had some other Cisco password to get in that maybe there's the few guys knew, and they just, even if they wrote it tattooed on their forehead, I wouldn't have gotten it. But meanwhile, it was super easy because it was just the single sign-on credentials. Well, I'm going to prove myself wrong because this place had a lot of vulnerabilities that you know, things like Nessus or whatever would have found. Uh, Rex D was on three machines. You don't see that anymore, but if you do, you get root immediately. It's like the most trivial little thing. Open X11, yeah, we all know that. We have tools that find it. And of course, we keystroked a guy and just kept going and going. And that, his account worked on 1,200 machines. S, you know, blank SA, anonymous FTP with Oracle data and passwords and credentials and shell scripts. Um, we actually did a target phishing attack, pretty standard, you know, emailed them, and of course a guy opened it. Pretty standard stuff. You know, but it, it, that's what I'm saying, I'm proving myself wrong, that the root cause of a lot of those was, oh, you found one thing that just needs to be fixed, but there's other things going on. So let's talk about, like, a theoretical attack, okay? Where, let's say that you have some Uber O'Day. Oh my gosh, I've got... MS 1194. Hopefully they're not that high yet. Uh, you know, it is so unknown. I've got it, and I'm going to go. And I get on an internal network, and I know the domain controller. I run my exploit, and immediately I'm system on a domain controller. Okay? Well, why was your attack, why did that work? You know, for a CISO. Remember the guy at the BMW? Why, why did that work? Well, it worked because they didn't have a patch. Okay, well, there's not a patch out there. So what did the CISO do wrong? What did he do wrong? Well, he ran Windows. Thank you, Linux guy in the back. Uh, <laughs> that's, you know, that's, that's usually me. Uh, yeah, you know, I'm sure we can have a big debate about what else he did wrong, and oh, it should have been firewall, blah, 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 blah. He didn't do anything wrong, you know? Or the patch came out two days ago, and also the exploit came out the same day as the patch, but this is a real place that can't just go and install patches every, you know, Every, whenever they come out, every, you know, every third hour. So obviously places have patch cycles. Well, see, the other thing is that they know, I don't know if it's on the next slide, no. They know what machines aren't patched. And they can say, oh, the domain controller, yeah, with that patch cycle's 14 days when that patch come out, came out 11 days ago, you're right, that patch is not gonna be installed. They don't have to run a tool, they don't have to do nothing. They already know the answer. So if you go in there and you run an O-Day, on the domain controller, you have proved nothing. And you have given them no knowledge. I mean, you, you, you look good, like, yeah, look at me, I'm pretty great. But, you know, it's going to be like, well, who cares? It, it, really, it really just does not matter that you did that. Because you didn't, you, you found nothing wrong from a technical standpoint, besides it doesn't have a patch, but the patch didn't exist. And you found no problem in the process. Because these places have all this software to manage patches, and you can go and ask them, say, hey, this machine, tell me what patches are installed on this and what patches aren't, and they can go and they pay auditors, you know, much more money than they pay me to do a pen test to just constantly be generating that crap. So 
I'm starting to sort of introduce the idea that, well, what's the purpose here? So it's easy to compromise these big networks. It's easy. You know, and you can see the methods I, a lot of methods I like to you are abusing trust. How do you audit trust? How do you, you know, if you're a Metasploit Pro or you're a Nessus or you're any of that stuff, how do you, how do you go and you audit trust? You know, meaning does one Unix machine trust the other? You know, what methods are they using? But, but more importantly, things like mistakes by users, passwords.txt on the desktop. We got in a pinch last week trying to get into the SA, or trying to get into like a, an international different part of the country, uh, company. And the way we got in was I was like, you know what? I'm going after this guy's workstation. Went straight to his desktop and passwords.txt was right there. Now I got lucky that I found the one guy out of three guys who did that. Um, but, that, but it was a huge issue because it led to this massive thing. But what was the technology? Should they have a program that goes and audits all their workstations and goes and looks for these kind of credentials? Well, they could. I will gladly sell them one or I'll make one or something like that, and that's fine. But don't you think that they probably, don't you think that's more of a training issue? I mean, don't you, from a management level, the person who's paying me, don't you think I need to tell him? Yeah, 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 you can go get a tool and pay a bazillion dollars, or you can tell them to fucking doing that, you know? <laughs> Which, I mean, that's not a, a unique thing, but that is what I put in my report. That was my recommendation, you know? And that's not what a tool is going to tell you. It's going to be like, I found this without the impact of it. Now, if I found it on a dev machine and it didn't work, then, hey, I still found it, but. So, but the admins do the exact same things. You know, they put sudo backdoors in for themselves. The password example, where I said that I cracked his password from the year before, he had to reset his password every 90 days to a different one. But when he did, he logged in as his domain admin and set it back. Because he didn't want to remember. He makes everyone else remember new passwords, but not himself. What's the issue there? What's the technical issue there? How can you fix that with a tool? I don't care. And the CISO doesn't care. Yeah, 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 I can get a tool. That, uh, yeah, let the, let, the, let the geeks you know, figure out the fix to that, I'm going to go beat the crap out of that guy, you know, and anyone else who does that, and that was our recommendation. Our recommendation is you need to tell those domain admins that they're not immune to those. They need to set an example. Even though we don't all look at each other's passwords, they need to be one that sets the examples. So, you know, the sudo, the passwords, the SSH keys, uh, and, you know, sharing credentials, all these sort of things like the rotating of the passwords, uh, you know, a lot of times they actually will rotate their passwords, but they'll make it go from 09 to 10 or 11. And I published all these John the Ripper rules that will just tear that apart. Um, so, but even things like architecture, I kept uh, the two different cases. I talked about single sign-on LDAP servers, you know, like big SiteMinder and every single web app goes to the same LDAP server. And, and they were like, yeah, we'll put an LDAP server and we'll just put it on our flat network. No one came along and said, hey, that's a really important machine. Maybe we should put that over here. Or maybe we should put a host firewall on it to only let, it, only let SSH come in from the four admins we have. You know, people, I'm sure someone said that at one point in time, but no one was going in there and, and actually said, no, this is the reason you got owned. Because if I had credentials to that machine and couldn't get to it, I would have wasted eight hours going and finding where the hell I had to come from, you know. I'd have to go, I don't have the ACLs in front of me, I have to go and figure out what they are. So something as simple as that where it's just some Nessus finding or just some IBM consultants can find and that's like, oh, uh, this is a flat network and that's bad. They know that. But what they don't know is the impact of that. Um, you know, poor configurations, poor, uh, poor implementations, setup configurations. I think we're all sort of familiar with that. So all of these sort of things create findings that aren't technical findings like what you would normally think. Like, oh, this Apache version has indexable directories enabled and that's a medium risk. No, it's, yeah, yeah, maybe it is. But your impact's one machine. You know, but what's the impact of the domain admins not actually rotating their passwords? That's not a technical issue. The impact of that was the entire network was compromised. That's what they need to know about. That's what they need to fix. Now, obviously, I'm going to tell them all the technical stuff, but I know that almost all the technical stuff I've told them, someone else has already told them. Like I said, they have the big expensive tools that even I don't have. You know, I don't have $30,000 to go and buy whatever it is. I don't even know because I don't have it because I can't afford it. 
you know? So can a scan, I'm sorry I keep picking on Nessus, I, I use it, I actually pay for it. I'm not picking at it on purpose, it's just an example that I can give and I'm not, you know, anyways. Um, can, it, can, can those kind of tools, can they actually report the real impact? The real, how is this going to affect business? Okay, like I, I didn't talk about it, but this one network, they segmented all their SAPs and you can't SSH to them, you can't do all this other stuff because they know they're crappy and they don't want them on their flat network. Well, I got on them and audited their passwords and almost all of their credentials, it's a complex password, but it's based on a pattern. The name of the company, two exclamation points, and then the host name. It's a complex password, except for once I figured it out, it worked on 2,000 accounts. Now, is that more important or less important than if it was on dev machines? It's a lot more important because it was systematic, it was everything, and the impact was huge because they used SAP for, um, what do you call it, everything. <laughs> you know, everything. So that's the kind of thing that when you start, you know, that's, that's why people badmouth this stuff, but I'm saying you, you need to, to know to even look for the kind of things that are this level above. So to a CISO or a CSO, like I said, O-days, exploits, they don't prove anything that they don't already know, okay? I, I actually kind of already said this, that they know they're not vulnerable, they have mechanisms in place, uh, they know exactly which is what, and anything like that. Now obviously, you know, software vendors care greatly about this. I'm not talking about auditing the code to go and try to, you know, to break the code or whatever. I'm talking about trying to break into systems, okay? Uh, I mean, obviously, you know, and I am totally jealous of <laughs> anyone who can do that stuff because they are important. You know, they're uber important. Finding new bugs, it makes safer software. I'm not saying it's a useless thing. I'm getting to what I'm saying. I'm trying to explain what I'm saying, but I gotta say some other stuff. So, well now have you started to notice that there's people like selling O-Days? I mean, they're selling. They're selling, you know, Metasploit modules for bugs that have been out there forever, but there's not a published exploit for them. Well, I mean, I, I wouldn't mind having those. It sure would make external pen tests a lot easier. But even on an external pen test, if, I, if it was an Apache or an IAS, well, no, there's never IAS bugs. Uh, that's a bad, no, so anyways, uh, if I had one of those, yes, it would give me my initial break in and things like that, but, the, but it's the same problem would come up. And I, I would love to have those and there's nothing wrong with using them, but it would still come up, oh, how do I fix that? And it would be patch management. And they go, oh, okay, well, I'll call in the 10 IBM contractors I have that manage patch management. And once again, I'm back to I haven't told them anything new. So, you know, in, so that's why I don't usually use them. Like I said, if I had them, I'd go and use them, but I sort of like that I, I, the way that I break in is using these other methods that is abusing users or admins. Admins don't like to know that they're actual users, but they are. So, so here's the question, and I, and I have to say, I'm being devil's advocate here, okay? I'm gonna say stuff that I don't actually believe, okay? This is a conversation. It's, it's a one-way conversation, but it's a conversation. Why do we worship them? Why, if you go and you present an O-Day and you hit enter and you get a shell, does the crowd clap and roar? Well, why as a community do we do that? Well, I know why, because I'm the guy in the back going, woo, yeah, that's fucking awesome, you know? It's cool, it's cool finding new stuff. I love that, finding stuff that other people haven't found, it proving your intelligence. Who doesn't want to know that they're smarter than other people? Nice people? Oh, I need to look into those people. You know, but I'm saying it feels good. I want to do that. It's fun to learn new things. I love that's what we're, that's what hacking is. That's what bodging is. Take something, take it apart, learn how it works, put it back together, make it better, things like that. It's cool. Sisos don't give a shit. It's 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 they they don't care. It's how do I fix it? Is it a is it a technical issue? Okay, I got technical guys to go and fix it. So it, it, I'm very torn on the zero day issue. I want people to keep doing it, but when people hear about what I do for a living, I'm like, they're like, oh man, you must have the craziest exploits. I'm like, meh, meh, no, 
you know. And then it's a lot like, oh, you spent how long did it take you to get a toehold? Because sometimes toeholds aren't that easy, meaning the first sh the first account on the first machine. Sometimes it's not that easy. I'm like, oh, why didn't you just fire up this? And I was like, yeah, I could have. You know, but then they always want to know, well, how did you get in first? What was your first thing that got you in? Because they always want to know. Because they, it can't be the same thing two years in a row, because what, what improvement can the CISO talk about then? They used the exact same thing last time that they used this year, or switch that. The same thing this time as they used last time, and it's going to be like, you didn't fix the one thing that got them going? And that what's, remember I said, this is a person, the BMW guy, you know? He's looking for, he needs to prove his improvement. So, anyways, I totally got distracted. So, how do we provide our worth? I'm wrapping up. So, how do we provide our worth to a CISO, okay? How do we do that? How do I make them come back, okay? And let me tell you, that when I do work, when my company, I'm expensive. I'm, you know... If we put in an assessment and we put in it's going to be this amount of money and you look at us versus some, you know, random competitor, it'll be twice as much. Or I don't know that. But, I mean, we're going to be more expensive. And people are like, I'm not going to use you all. We're like, okay, we'll talk to us next year. And then eventually we do get in. And then we never leave. Because, you know, why do people buy luxury cars? Because they're better. I don't. I drive a fucking little piece of shit. But, you know, but it's a piece of shit. And I know it's a piece of shit. I don't care. When it dies, I get another one. So anyways, um, Nessus, any sort of scanning software, any sort of auditing, it can provide you metrics. It can provide, you know, how many ports you have open, how many OpenX11 shares that you have a month ago, how many do you have now, okay? You have auditing teams that make a lot more money than I do, okay? And they just sit there and go, okay, have you installed this patch? No, check, you know, and stuff like that. Tons of those guys, tons and tons and tons of them. They're the ones in the tides. They have all this data that I'm like trying to figure out, you know? And then you have SOX teams and, and Sarbanes-Oxley, oh, there's all that horrible, horrible stuff. You have teams that do all that. They're reporting all the same sort of data back. Now I can go and run tools and I can provide a report that, you know, is almost the same data. So what I'm saying is how can you provide worth is report, find things, find problems that no one else is going to find. Now I'm not saying you have to be obtuse. That's not my point. And I'm not trying to be obtuse. If I'm being obtuse, sorry. I'm saying, you know, there are big time problems that have to be fixed that are much bigger deal than, you know, oh, I forgot to install that hot fix, you know. So user mistakes, admin mistakes, the architectures. Do you have a flat network? Yeah, everyone's got a flat network. Well, what's the impact of that? How does that actually, there is a reason that place took their SAP and segmented it. There's a reason. Because they're like, oh, it's just a dev machine. What's the big deal? It's a dev machine with, with, with production SAP data, which is, like I said, the king's everything to them. So they moved everything off. And you know what they're going to do next year? They're going to segment more stuff. They're going to be like, well, why are our Oracle servers on the same flat network? And I'm like, I don't know. And they're going to go and segment that. And what's going to happen the next year? And they're going to keep doing that. Like, well, why are our workstation networks right next to our server networks? And they're going to go and segment that. And unfortunately, they have to get burned every time. But fortunately, I make money every time they get burned. <laughs> So uh, there's a lot of words here, but mismanagement, this is a lot of things. I go into a place and admins, they, they, I'm a bad guy. I'm there to make them look bad. And I'll admit it's a side effect, okay? But I like those guys. I mean, those are the nerdiest guys in the place. I, that's who I want to go have a beer with. You know, I mean, if I have them enough, they'll tell me the passwords. But... <laughs> But how are things managed? If you have a bunch of sysadmins who are constantly dealing with tickets, you know, that's like the nasty word. Tickets, oh, I had a thousand tickets today. Do they have time to go and research new things? You know, do, do, if I'm telling you to get rid of NIST and they'd like need time to go and research a replacement for NIST and try it out in depth, if they don't have time to do that, whose fault is that? Management, you know, and who does management report to? Executives. CISO, that's a CISO's fault. It's my job to come along and say, dude, your guys are just, they're, they're getting killed. You need to do this. You know, you know, it's like the whole thing about Google. You know, the whole thing about Google, you work four days and then you're given one day a week or one day every other week. I forget what the policy is. And they want you to go and do research and do independent knowledge. It is a policy that they want people to do that. And that is why. Now, I'm not saying that's a good and bad thing. And I don't always include that in my report. But I sure as hell let it know. 
because it's not always, oh my God, look at these idiots, look what they're doing wrong, things like that. But it is definitely an issue. Now, some places it's not an issue, some places it is an issue, where the admins are just getting killed. And it's not the admins' fault. It's not that they need to work harder, and that it's not that they need to be work smarter, it's that you need to hire another fucking admin. So, so I'm done. Uh, like I said, I have some shirts. They're from my contest they're from two years ago, but they're still pretty cool shirts, and shirts cost money. Uh, so there's a pa if you know the password, you can get a free shirt, or if no one knows the password, you can't just type it in, look it up. I'll throw you a shirt later. But most of them are mediums, so skinny guys. So Any questions? Questions? Comments? Shoot. Awareness, you know, and aware. I think training, and I always say training, but training can be training them that, hey, we actually know you're a dumbass. I, I, I think awareness, and awareness a lot of times can be like, oh, now I'm aware of the problem. Or it can be, I'm aware of what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, I'm aware that you're a fucking idiot, you know. Uh, but yeah, no, it's a good question. Yeah, I kept saying training. I didn't mean to imply that that was the option. And oh, by the way, I sell training, sir. No, I'm kidding. Uh, <laughs> So I didn't mean to imply that that's the one thing, but if you don't know your passwords, if you don't audit your passwords, you don't know your passwords are bad, so therefore how can you fix them or make them better? So you need to, it's the same thing. If you don't know your admins are selectively intelligent, uh, then, you, then you can't make them more intelligent. Nope, never have. Uh, because I don't, it's, you get, it, it's, it, the question was, have I ever had to like uh, recommend uh, more accountability on, on, the, on behalf? I think a lot of it is implied. If I point out a single thing that's going wrong, I think, uh, I mean, if it's anything like any place I've ever worked ever with techies, uh, if the guy sitting next to me does something wrong, I'm going to bust his balls till he fix it. So there's a lot of implied, but like I don't ever, because the thing is you don't really, you have to be really careful when you make business recommendations because a lot of times you're there for five days and all you know is like what they serve in the cafeteria. So you have to be problem, you have to be careful what you recommend on a business level uh, because maybe they are doing that, but that guy's a wanker. So. Any, any other questions, comments, opinions? Uh, I, I may have an extra large. So I heard, yeah, the people who said it, come on up. <laughs> I got mediums, large, and ones. Thanks a lot, everybody. Thanks a lot.